Good everyone, and thank you for uh, once again for taking the time to attend Labella's live refresh webcast on our system copy solution. We have an action-packed session for you today. Uh, we'll be, of course, uh, introducing you, those of you who are unfamiliar with our organization to Labella and our, our solution uh, lineup, uh, as well as you know the architecture and the framework of the system refresh solution. This will, of course, include a live free, uh, refresh demo, which is something that um, is, is we have never done in the past and will be very unique. So um, hopefully this is something you all are looking forward to. OK, before we get started, um, I'll, with introducing the team and the agenda, just some logistical items here. Everyone's going to be muted for uh, the duration of the session. Uh, for, with respect to audio, you can uh, dial in via the telephone if you haven't already done that, or you can use your speaker on your laptop or, or whatever your device of choice is. Um, we will have a Q&A session at the end of the webinar today, so what you can do is go ahead and enter your questions at any time during the broadcast into the GoToWebinar window, and uh, we'll take those questions again at, at the end of the session. All right, let me go ahead and introduce the team. First and foremost, I'm your host. My name is Keith Pagel. I'm a senior account manager here at Labella, and I have responsibility for a large portion of our uh, customer base uh, across the US. Uh, I am joined by our speaker today, uh, Baron Beyer, who is our senior solution architect here. Uh, had many years of experience working with uh, the Labella team as well as with our solutions and product um, lineup as well, in particular with SAP and system refresh automation. Um, and then finally, our presenter, Vomzi, who is our senior technical consultant and service delivery manager, has uh, a great deal of experience on the ground with our customers, both on the, from a pre-sales perspective and then also um, an implementation time, uh, has dealt with uh, many, many scenarios um, that range in you know, size and complexity. So uh, he'll be taking us through the, the demo portion of the session today. So just a quick uh, agenda. I'll be introducing you to uh, the company here and, and uh, our, our solution lineup, um, at which point I'll then turn it over to Baron for our system copy overview, where he will provide, again, a, a bit of a summary on the architecture and introduce you to uh, our best practices and our approach to system refresh automation. Um, this will be followed by our live refresh demo, of course, on AWS. And then we'll have time at the end for the Q&A. OK, so for those of you who are, are just joining us for the first time, a little bit about Lavella. We were founded in the, in the mid-'90s, actually in 1994, in Stuttgart, Germany. Um, and established a, a U.S. office uh, here in the Atlanta area in 2009. Actually, have had local distribution since 2004. Uh, and Atlanta is where we are all joining you from today. Um, we were originally established as a disaster recovery organization and still have a very large disaster recovery practice um, with a cross-platform tool with many, many installations across a large cross-section of, of customers. Uh, we launched our system refresh automation solution in 2011, and that's uh, really taken off um, and as organizations have uh, a great need to, um, to refresh and refresh often, and it's not typically an easy process. Um, we also have landscape management tools and data masking solutions as well that were introduced here in 2015. Uh, as far as customers and installations, our customers run the gamut. We have uh, a number of customers that have over a billion dollars in revenue, including eight of those global Fortune 50 customers, uh, 50 companies, I should say. And it's estimated that nearly 40% of our customers are public companies. Uh, we also have a growing small business practice as well. Um, we have a wide range of experience in implementations, um, you know, all the way on up to uh, over 100 terabyte landscapes. We're very familiar with complex landscapes um, and you know all kinds of unique situations with respect to uh, nuances in different environments. 
So as far as our product line is concerned, I touched a little bit on it in the last slide, but for purposes of today, we'll be talking about the primarily the system copy uh, product lineup, which of course are the core of that is the system copy solution. There are some add-ons uh, for local client copies. We have a client copy add-on. We have a data masking add-on, which we'll talk about as well during the context of today's discussion, which allows you to, to obfuscate or mask data in non-production or QA systems. Uh, and there's also, of course, a database copy add-on as well. We, of course, got our business shadow, which is our disaster recovery solution, which is, is cross-platform, as you can see, and, and, and runs the gamut of platforms. Um, the landscape management tools, which I mentioned previously, uh, for things like IDOS and EDI monitoring. And then data security tools, we, we have the data masking, um, not only in the context of the system copy, but also as a standalone solution as well. Okay, some, some highlights on what we're going to focus on today so that you can focus your attention uh, properly. Um, we're going to go ahead and obviously, as I mentioned, introduce the system refresh automation so, um, solution. But what we want to do is really give you a, a deep view of the methodology and the architecture behind the solution um, as we get started. Um, so as we, as we do that, pay, you know, pay attention to, uh, to, to some of those uh, slides on the architecture. Uh, of course, we'll be doing a live refresh on a on an SAP or a NetWeaver system um, using a system copy solution. During the course of that, we're going to show you how to configure, how to refresh tasks, how to configure and, and do landscape refreshes. And we're going to look at a, a, a variety of different types of reports, both simple and, and more detailed. Um, of course, something that I, I'm sure of all of you are interested in is how to how to reduce the amount of time you're spending doing refreshes. That's probably one of the key things. And of course, the title of today's webinar. Um, and then, of course, we're going to have the Q&A there at the end. Just to highlight, though, going back, the, the, the two key things that you'll want to uh, pay special attention to, of, of, of course, is the refresh itself, um, and then how we're uh, going about dramatically reducing that amount of time that customers are spending doing refreshes in some cases up to 50% less time than they were doing previously using manual processes. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and um, turn it over to uh, Baron for the start of the system copy overview itself, and then that'll lead us into the live refresh demo. Excellent, and thank you very much, Keith, for the introduction. Again, my name is Bernd Bayer. I am a solution architect here with Libelle, working out of our Atlanta office. And before we head into the live refresh demo, which is going to be presented by WAMSI on AWS, I want to spend 10 to 15 minutes talking about the architecture, talking about the underlying methodology, and um, walk everybody through and set the stage what we're going to see in the live demo. And that's going to help you understand better when Vams is going to talk about the GUI or the server process, it's going to help you finding a place for that in the overall architecture. And before we get into that, a quick reference to the title. Our title of the presentation is today, um, How to do a refresh in 90 minutes or less. And my team and I, we thought a, long, a lot about what is a good title for this presentation, because we know refreshes, and we have been doing it for five years now, and we know some customers spend a couple of hours for a refresh, some other customers, and most people actually a couple of days, and we have customers where the old refresh took a couple of weeks, four weeks, six weeks for a complete refresh of a large complex landscape. And our goal and the message for the webcast today is specifically how can you dramatically accelerate the execution time for the refresh and can hand over those systems much faster than you did in the past. We are targeting at least to cut the time in half. And I want you to focus on in the presentation of on the aspects of automation, which is the key of speeding up everything. We run software to do the refresh. 
the aspect of running things in parallel, not only a single refresh, but multiple uh, landscapes are getting refreshed at the same time. I want you to focus on the BDLS process because that's one of the large time savers we see and on the database copy phase as part of the uh, system refresh um, after pre-processing and before post-processing. So let's get started into the system refresh process and everybody working with SAP probably knows that the system refresh is a process that could get complicated, it could take a while and it's usually a manually effort which is binding the resources of a large portion of the SAP basis people and when you do things manual, it, you by nature have the issue of doing errors, of committing tiny little mistakes and the issue is really you kick off a job, you do something else, you come back a couple of hours later, try another job and this is just destined for at least a couple of failures, a couple of mistakes because we are not machines, we have other things on our mind and we can't operate like, like a machine um, on, on, a, on a repetitive process. The process is also highly predictable, it has to be executed over and over so you know there's a refresh every quarter or every six months or every month for some customers. It has to be done for every SAP system, it has to be done for most SAP systems, it has to be done for a number of target systems in the simplest case you have production plus QA plus sandbox, sandbox plus development but most customers in the meantime they have a couple of sandbox systems, they have a couple of QA and additional pre-production systems so it can get very complicated very fast and we have a simple formula to the, towards the bottom of the slide if you just add up systems, sources, targets, um, number of refreshes, number of tasks it is a lot to, to manage, especially if you don't have a software to, to automate that. So what, are, what we are propagating as Libelle is to have a software defining the system refresh process. And this software defined refresh or software defined data center is a common concept which gains more and more popularity I think the key driver in software defined anything is the cloud computing. If you ever work with AWS, everything on AWS is automated. You deploy machines, you auto scale up, you auto scale down and software is behind all of that which is orchestrating workflows. So what we are doing, we are taking this orchestration of a workflow and apply it to the system refresh process. It is a complex process but it is fairly standardized. We're doing the same thing over and over. We know there are specific SAP tasks in terms of pre-processing and post-processing. They are very well documented, they are very well standardized by SAP, by best practices. There are system copy guides for different um, applications so it's a fairly standardized process. More on a company level or an organization level there are operating system, storage and database tasks so if you do a backup and restore there are certain steps you have to do depending on the database and um, on the storage if you have a snapshot there's a predefined sequence of steps you are executing in order to do a system refresh. So what we are doing is we standardize the tasks, we automate the tasks and we orchestrate the um, automation workflow with the system copy tool. There are potentially non-standardized or manual tasks but if you break down let's say 300 tasks and automate 280 of them and focus on 20 manual steps that's a huge improvement from a potential 80% manual process or even 60% manual process. And we spoke to a lot of customers who already orchestrated the process with scripts so they went through the same process on a smaller scale than we as a system copy software provider and orchestrated the process for themselves and they have scripts but it's still not the same running scripts versus running an automation software and we speak and work with many of those customers where we actually take their automated workflow and put it into the system copy framework and automate a lot of, orchestrate a lot of steps, they already automated and make this a, a, um, a process where we don't even supply all the tasks, a lot of the tasks are coming from the customers. 
So I want to introduce the system copy software. What is system copy? Um, it is a piece of software. It is containing of three main components. We have first of all what we call tasks. So when you look at your system refresh process, you got to break down the different steps you have to do as part of the refresh. You want to export users, you want to import them later, you got to take care of the batch jobs, you got to take care of um, starting SAP, stopping SAP, you got to take care of BDLS. This is the workflow of how to do a refresh. If you have a system copy process in a Word document with 200 or 300 pages, this is exactly what we mean with the tasks is how do I do a refresh for this system in this setting with this target in this environment. The second component of the system copy tool is the server agents. So now that we know what do we need to do, we need to figure out how we run those tasks. So our server agent is a fairly simple but at the same time sophisticated framework of executing tasks on a server. Our server agents, and this is a very important aspect of our software, is running directly on the server um, outside SAP. So with that we can execute servers on the database, on the operating system, on the storage software, and we can execute anything inside SAP by simply connecting to it. Um, uh, and run anything inside SAP. So those server agents are a key aspect of executing the tasks. And then we have certain task types which can be executed by the server agents which are running APA programs, running imports, running exports, um, running shell scripts. We support different um, shell uh, scripting languages starting from a standard bash, uh, bash shell to uh, KSH, to uh, Windows PowerShell, and we even have our own shell scripting language which is cross-platform, which is a bit more sophisticated and allows us to do some really fast things and steps as part of the process. And finally, you need a front-end to manage your refreshes, and this is in the graphical user interface, and a lot of the demonstration uh, from Wamsi is going to be shown in the graphical user interface whereby he also shows some things in, a lot of things in the back end. But this is on the right hand side something we're going to look at in the live refresh. We start here in a couple of minutes. I want to point out the core process of how to do refreshes and that again helps later putting things in the perspective when he shows the actual export and the actual import. So the key refresh process for us is we have a production system, let's say this is ECC, and we want to refresh our sandbox system, which our QAS system in this example. And when we start the refresh process, the first phase is an export phase where we export all the settings we want to keep from that Q system um, before we completely overwrite that Q database with the production database. So in the pre-processing, we export. In the copy phase, there's a full database copy, which is overriding everything in the queue system. And then we re-import all the settings we exported in the beginning. With that, you have a queue system, which has all the settings you had before, the same users, the same RFC settings, everything you configured tediously for that queue system is kept, but all the business data are updated from production. And this is key to how to do a refresh and in the meantime this process established itself as some of the standard processes of how to do a system refresh. After pre-processing and before post-processing there has to be a phase of copying the database. You got your production database, you got the queue database and they are separate instances, separate databases, separate names. So at a certain point, you got to copy that database. Now, there are different ways to do that and different customers have different preferences and we don't necessarily need to change that process of how you copy the database. We offer a couple of options though. So first of all, you say, I do backup restore, I'm perfectly happy with that and that's part of my refresh, you continue doing that. We suggest to do some automation around that. 
there are some really good snapshot tools, and I hope um, I, I didn't miss any any vendor. There are three fresh tools from HP, from IBM, from from Dell, from EMC. So you do a snapshot of the database. Same process. If you do snapshots, it's a set. It's a sequence of probably 10 to 15 steps in order to do that snapshot. Snapshots are amazing because you can you can clone. A storage volume within a couple of minutes. Different technologies work differently, so the question is can I use it after a couple of minutes or do I have to wait until that clone or uh, snapshot is completely synced? Typically it's the later, so you have to wait until that snapshot is completed. And then finally, we have a database copy tool. If you don't have anything in place and would like to have an alternative, um, once is going to present our database copy tool. Our DB copy tool is going ahead and is copying online the production database or a standby database from production to the queue system. We do this for Oracle, we do this for MaxDB, we do this for Sybase, we do it for um, DB2 Oracle, uh, Microsoft SQL Server, and of course for the uh, HANA database. As we expanded on the system refresh tool, we expanded on the scope. In the beginning, we had pre and post. We always had a database copy tool because it's based on our original uh, database replication software. So what we do is we tightly integrate the database copy either for a single refresh or have multiple uh, copies of, um, of a landscape like ECC, BI, and SCM plus live cache coordinated with a database copy where that process is uh, neatly organized and orchestrated. We have customers who are following a system copy with a client copy process. We have that fully automated. It's neat. It's, out, it's like working out of the same framework, so this is really helpful. And then in 2015, we launched a data masking tool. We had data masking tasks for HR, which were very basic already in the software, but we decided data masking for non-production system is such a big market with such a big future ahead based on security concerns and, and data privacy and, and new laws that we made a completely standalone product out of it, which again, coming back to the system copy, fully integrates in the system copy. So you do a pre, copy and post, and then you mask and obfuscate all sensitive data, typically HR in an SAP setting. Before I slowly hand over the presenter role to Wamsi, I want to do a quick summary and a quick outlook for the presentation. We have the key phases in the middle, pre-copy and post uh, in the system refresh. We have the libelle task repositories, which are our default tasks coming with the software, which are up to 400 different tasks which are supporting different systems. So we've got tasks for BI, we've got tasks for live cache, we of course got tasks for ECC, which is always the, the standard, um, standard system. You add potentially customer-specific tasks, either in your own repository or you just customize five or ten tasks and add them to the process. System copy is typically installed on the stage server. If you have a large landscape, you can have it on a separate server where you consolidate all the different refresh configurations and that's done fairly easy. And then the system copy graphical user interface is the front end for the administrator who is executing the refresh. So before that, before I hand over to Wamsi, I want to point out again the points I recommend to look out for in the presentation. So I want you to focus on the BDLS because this is a dramatic acceleration. I want to focus on the fact that we execute certain steps in parallel. So when you see a refresh later, you're going to see, oh, those five steps, they're executing all in parallel. And then we can execute refreshes for different systems in parallel. So while we refresh ECC, at the same time, you refresh um, a BI. It's self-documenting. And we accelerated the copy process with our uh, DB copy tool, but you can also, if you have snapshots, remember, also use snapshots. You're going to get the acceleration of the execution by 
continuous improvement of a repetitive execution. You execute at the same time over and over, gives you great opportunity to tweak the process every time and make it a tiny little better in different aspects. It's dramatically faster than manually execution um, because it is software defined and you can cascade software better than humans. There's no limit of how often you run that software. It doesn't cost you anything more. And then the orchestrated orchestrated workflow is dramatically more effective than even have you, if you have scripts which are amazing, uh, you still need to orchestrate that. So with that, I want to hand um, over the presenter role to Wansi, and I'm extremely excited about this AWS demo. It's something I wanted to see for over a year now. We never got to setting up the full refresh on AWS, so I'm very excited to show and to see a real refresh from end to end um, on AWS and presented by Wansi. So Wamsi, I'm going to hand over the uh, presenter role to you. And you are still on mute in case you try to uh, talk. Thank you, Brent. Uh, thanks for uh, the wonderful uh, introduction to the tool. Uh, before I go ahead with the presentation, I would like to um, talk about the uh, logistics, what we have uh, uh, built uh, for this demo. And uh, then I would kick off the refresh and then talk about the tool in detail. Bernd has done a very uh, detailed presentation of the various components that comes into the system refresh process with the tool. Uh, and I'm going to show those components uh, in, in real-time scenarios here. And then I'm also going to showcase how we, with our database copy tool, copy the database and then do the post-processing and um, I'm going to talk about some uh, cool concepts about how you can do a multiple system refresh and how you can manage the refreshes and orchestrating the refreshes and things like that. So let me quickly start off with the, um, with the logistics. Uh, I hope you all can see my screen. Um, I have machines running here on uh, AWS Cloud. I have two uh, machines, VM1, VM2, which are the um, uh, VM1 is the source of SAP system, VM2 is the target SAP system. So both are uh, pretty small machines, the T2 mediums, uh, if you're aware about uh, T2 mediums, they're uh, having two CPUs and four gig memory. So they don't have uh, much power, so you might um, want to see um, this, uh, this in a real-time scenario. If you have like four CPUs or eight, eight uh, gig memory, then it will be a bit more faster. But even with the four, uh, two CPUs and four gig memory, it's, uh, it's dramatically faster. And then I have my Gembox, which is the machine with which, where I have installed the graphical user interface, installed SAP GUI and everything. Uh, and the NAT instance is, is something which uh, we use for our network. So that's the background here and the systems here. Uh, they are, as I said, um, micro uh, T2 medium instances with two, gig, two, two CPUs and four gig memory and um, they are running on Red Hat 6.6. Uh, .6. Uh, we have installed uh, SAP NetWeaver 7.3 and I have made some very basic configuration uh, which I'm going to uh, show you shortly. So these are the systems and let me open this terminal windows to do systems. So on the left you see the Linux box VM1. So this is the source system and on the right you see VM2 which is the target system. So I'm copying uh, SAP uh, uh, doing the system refresh from VM1 to VM2 and uh, you can see that SAP is running on VM1 and SAP is running on VM2 and both have uh, different uh, instance numbers and um, everything. So let me open the SAP GUIs. I already have them opened. So the default client uh, on both machines are um, uh, 100 so you see here on the production system VM1 and here the quality system VM2 so we just have uh, some placeholders uh, so just to just before I go ahead and uh, kick off the uh, refresh I'm going to uh, show you that there are indeed some differences between these two things the main difference that you can see straight away is the uh, background picture which of course we uh, retain um, 
So you will see the same background picture in VM2 after we refresh the system. Uh, but let me show you uh, the most common things like uh, SU01, the users. So on VM1, uh, I'm look, showing you all the users that we have here on VM1. And you see here a demo VM1, demo VM2, a demo VM3. And the same thing will go on uh, VM2. So I'm going to show you the users here real quickly. So you have here demo VM2, demo VM2. 2 VM2 and demo 3 VM2. So what we uh, stand as a standard do is back up the users or export the users and import the users back. This is one way of validating that we did indeed do a refresh. Uh, we can go into a any transaction that you would like to, but this is something which is pretty simple and, and most commonly uh, used. We export the bad jobs, uh, which, which I'm going to uh, discuss in detail while we are doing the refresh. Since we have uh, around 40, 45 minutes to to show the uh, refresh, I would uh, like to do that while the refresh is happening. So these are the two SAP boxes uh, I have shown you. Uh, the left is the source system. On the right, VM2 is the target system. And then, as Brent explained in the previous slides, we have a graphical user interface. I already have done some uh, executions earlier today just to make sure things are working fine. Uh, on the graphical user interface, you see a configuration here, VM1, VM2. I'm going to walk you through the configuration of the graphical user interface for now. Just keep in mind that this is the control center where, you, where you're going to execute the system refreshes. So without any uh, delay, I'm kicking off the uh, refresh here. So you have here uh, SAPs up and running, as you have seen on both uh, VM1 and VM2. I'm going to kick ahead, uh, go ahead and uh, start the uh, refreshes. So I'm starting the execution now, and it will ask for a confirmation. I click on OK, and now it's starting the execution. So now it's going to run through all those phases, pre, copy, and post phase. Uh, there is a phase called check phase, which uh, we didn't uh, talk about, because this is basically validating both the systems, the source and target system and making sure that we are doing a homogeneous system copy and not a heterogeneous. And um, that is the reason why we try to collect uh, information from both source and target and validate things and make sure that systems are ready and uh, could, we can go ahead and do a refresh. So it's done with the check phase and now it's kicking off uh, with the pre-phase. So in the classical user interface, we have three different tabs. We have a setup tab, we have a monitor tab, and we have an administration tab. But honestly, most of the times you will be dealing with only uh, the monitor tab. The setup tab is the tab where you deal with when you're preparing the configuration. So once you're done with setting up the workflow that suits your environment, uh, it's all about monitor tab. You have everything that you, you can do. You can look at the logs. You can look at um, the history of executions and everything. So I'm going to do a deep dive into setup at a later point of time. But um, the second component which Bernd talk, talked about are the, the tasks. So these are the uh, logical execution units. So if you see, we have a total of 180 steps for this refresh, 180 post steps. And then we have amount or probably half of that in the pre-phase. And then we have around 15 to 20 tasks in the copy phase. So if you look at the copy phase, we have 15 tasks. Again, the copy phase is with our tool. And then we have here pre-phase where you have uh, 60 to 70 tasks. So we're talking about roughly around 250 to 300 tasks per refresh. And we have a comprehensive set of tasks for all database types and for all operating systems. Uh, I'm going to uh, show that when I run the setup wizard, which I'm going to show you when we are executing the post phase. Uh, but for now, uh, we have an extremely uh, dedicated team uh, which works exclusively on developing and defining new tasks based upon the feedback that we get from customers or based upon the developments that SAP make or in, the, in, in their development process. So we have, we con continuously try to improve our task base. Currently we stand at close to 450 different tasks and uh, most of them are self-explanatory, as you see. I'm going to pick up one task uh, when I uh, do a deep dive into the uh, task and workflow uh, and show you uh, how a task look like. Uh, but for now, uh, we, we have 
a team which exclusively works on the uh, development of new tasks and uh, we have close to uh, 450 tasks which are uh, for different databases and uh, operating systems. And the third component itself is a server component. Uh, let me go back to the terminal here and uh, clear the screen here. And the server agent itself is a, a small agent. We, we recommend you to give us a disk space of around one gig per refresh. Again, this one gig is not for the server process. The server itself is like occupying close to 250 meg. The remaining space is for the actual exports that you make. So we are we are doing pre, uh, exports in the pre phase where we back up all the configuration settings, be it RFCs, be it bad jobs, be it users, uh, be it TMS settings. So we export all the settings uh, on tables from the database and we keep them in the file system. So we normally recommend around one to two gig of disk space depending upon the uh, size of your SAP system. So the server process, as I said, itself is taking around 200 uh, to 250 meg. So let me uh, just grab for the server process. So I'm grabbing for LSE here, and you see that the LSE is running and listening on port 9000. Uh, and of course, it runs as uh, with the user seed ADM that is uh, most important because most of our tasks uh, they use the SAP binaries like RTTrans or TP to to run exports and to run the user exports and things like that. So it's important that we run our binary at CDADM. Uh, you can, of course, run it as Aura said, uh, if you want to run only Oracle-specific tasks. But in case if you have a distributed system where you have um, an uh, SAP installed on a different machine and Oracle on a different machine, you can install two binaries, one on the Oracle box and one on the SAP box. And on the Oracle box, you can, of course, run the binary as uh, Aura said. But on the SAP box, we recommend it to be installed as CDADM, and uh, it's listening on port 9000. Let's do the same thing on the uh, target machine, just to be sure. So on the target machine, it's running. And if you see, there is a difference here. The source is running on 9000, and target is running on 9001. Uh, the reason why you don't have to do that, the reason why we want to do it that way is to showcase that uh, cross-port communication is possible, so you don't have to have all agents running on the same port number. Uh, and the advantage of having this feature is that if you have an LPAR or a huge uh, box on which you have multiple SAP systems installed, which is typically the case when you do your uh, QBOX installation or sandbox, you want to have one huge box on which you install multiple SAP systems, we would recommend you to go ahead and um, turn the LSC process on the same box multiple times, of course, with different users and with different port numbers. That is, that is very much uh, possible. Uh, let me quickly go to the directory here, uh, the LSC directory, and uh, show you the disk space that the directory consumes. There might be, uh, yeah, so there might be huge disk space consumed because, as I said, I have run couple of uh, trial runs before before this webcast and uh, I didn't want to clean up the disk space because I want to show you uh, some more uh, components like the history component and how, how you can leverage the, the whole history thing. So as you see uh, it's 760 meg but the bin directory itself in which you have the binaries they are, are roughly around uh, 11 meg, and of course we have some libraries which we bind uh, the binaries. So the, if, you, if you talk about a fresh installation, it's, it's around 250 meg, and we start the agent as CDADM uh, on a dedicated port, and, and the agent keeps listening on the port uh, and uh, waits for commands to uh, to execute. And then there are different types of deployment architectures we would like to uh, talk about. Um, but since it's a very uh, basic installation, you have one source and one target system, uh, we can have an agent installed here and an agent installed uh, on the source side and the agent installed on the target side. Uh, typically, the agent on the target side um, is called the master agent. Uh, the reason being, there are lots of exports that we make on target. We don't make any exports on the source. 
um, they are only exports or the configuration exports that we make on target. So uh, just to keep things simple, we want to have uh, a, a master agent running on the uh, target side, but not on the source side. But there are other concepts like master worker concept, which will, which we would probably uh, discuss once we uh, hit the post phase. Um, and um, see how, how it's different from this uh, typical uh, standalone uh, installation. So let me go back and see if the, uh, go back to the GUI and see if the preface is done. So I'm going to the monitor tab and I could see that the execution here has stopped. So if I scroll down and it's waiting for me to stop SAP, I just put this placeholder um, deliberately because I want to uh, talk a little bit about this uh, placeholders. If you see a human icon here, it's a place or it's a in interactive task. Uh, on the left, uh, you see the type is interactive. It means if you want to do anything before you go ahead, we go ahead and stop SAP, you can now do that. For example, if you want to uh, read on the exports, you can always uh, select one particular task and say execute this task only. Or um, for example, if you see there's a difference in sector or if you had a new RFC or if you have new users. You could always execute that single task, or if you think you want to just trash this whole export and read on the exports, you can go to the first export, right click, and say execute this task only. So we are done with the preface here. Um, for each task we have, um, let me explore the task here. For each task we have uh, a set of data files and log files generated. I'm going to do a deep dive into this uh, once we start the database copy because database copy is, is probably taking around uh, 15 to 20 minutes. So I would go ahead and now kick off the database copy. So when I say uh, continue here, it's going to stop the SAP system and then start the database copy. And I'm going to uh, show briefly the database copy tool once it's uh, starting the database copy. So I'm going to continue with the execution. So it's now going ahead and stop SAP. So if you go to VM2, it, it, it has a message here that system copy is executed because we have a task where we can broadcast a message saying uh, system copy will be executed. But uh, it should briefly uh, at any moment stop SAP. So yep, it's gone. So VM2 is now down and uh, you cannot uh, connect to VM2. So now it's stopping the SAP and it kicks off the database. Uh, the database component, again, as you see here, we have a similar kind of interface, but it's a bit different. We have here uh, the source oral in VM1 and target oral in VM2, and uh, we are going to copy the database. So this is our database copy tool. Uh, the intention of the tool is not to perform database copy, but in fact, it's a disaster recovery tool. So we copy the production database onto the, we, we copy a source system onto a secondary location and continuously replicate it. But we are currently leveraging this tool as a database copy tool because it integrates so seamlessly into the system copy platform and uh, it works great. So right now, the copy is kicking off. So um, you should shortly see the messages here at the bottom. So it's saying it's starting the copy. Now it, uh, the way the copy happens, uh, I'm sure Brent has explained this, but I'm going to just uh, reiterate the thing that we are uh, going to set the table space in backup mode. We take table space by table space, set it to backup mode, copy the table space data file, and take it off from backup mode. And we do this in parallel. So. Uh, the performance itself will be uh, huge. So this is around uh, 50 um, gig database. We don't have any performance tweaks. We just took it out of box and cop copying. So it will take around 15 minutes to uh, finish off the copy. So in the meantime, let me go ahead and uh, walk you uh, through the system copy GUI. The database copy uh, keeps on happening. So let's for the next 15 minutes, I'm going to explain you the GUI and how what are the different components in the GUI. So as I said earlier, monitor tab is a tab which you will work with mostly, but when we are setting up the software initially, the setup tab is a tab that we'll be dealing with heavily. So 
in the setup tab on the left hand side you see all the list of configurations uh, again these configurations I want to uh, talk about these things when we talk about configuration management uh, typically that would be in the in the post uh, phase uh, but when we are setting up configuration each configuration has a unique name and of course description and uh, if you remember I talked about uh, the master and worker agents the master agent is the agent which holds the configuration as well as the data file. So uh, the data files is, uh, are the exports that we make. So when you see the master agent, uh, in, in our case, as I said, it's a simple landscape. We want to do it on the target box, which is VM2. Uh, and of course, VM2, uh, if you remember, it's running on port 9001. And then we have the systems that take part in the refresh. So we have two systems here. VM1, VM2, uh, both uh, are VM2 is target SAP, target DB, and uh, VM1 is source app, source step, uh, source DB. Uh, but if you have distributed, you probably will be having four systems. Or if you're talking about uh, live cache refresh, uh, then we also have to include the Max DB system because we perform some uh, post processing activities on, on the live cache system. So the list of the systems. Um, you can keep on adding here um, the most complex configuration we have so far. Uh, at one of our customers, we have here uh, six systems, uh, and each system has a, a defined role uh, to perform. So these are the four different roles that we can give. We can give target app, target DB, source app, source DB. But if there is anything else that you want to give, that would be, of course, the fifth role would be satellite. So you can define uh, n number of satellites. So for each system, if you do a drill down, you would be having uh, uh, the worker settings itself. They are uh, automatically picked up by the GUI because the GUI communicates with this port number uh, on this host and it gets the system information. But you need to imp input this information here. We need to provide the SAP data, what clients we have on the system. Uh, of course, we have to provide a uh, client 000, which is uh, uh, because we want to export TMS settings and re-import TMS settings. So once the refresh is done, you don't have to configure TMS. We export and import back the complete TMS settings. Uh, and of course, the production client uh, 100, uh, you have to provide a user for us because this is the user we will be using uh, to make an RFC connection and execute uh, RFC tasks or ABAP tasks. And of course, we need the database information so we have all the database information uh, the schema user uh, we typically connect to database using the schema user and password so that we have complete rights on on the table so uh, we use the schema owner and password to connect and then once you configure systems for both our source and target then we come to copy to this is where the DB shadow part or the copy tool that we're using today is integrated. So all we're doing here is we're saying that the DB shadow is running on port 7200 and we want to talk with the configuration LSC VM1 VM2. Uh, as you see here the configuration name here is LSC VM1 VM2. So all we're doing is we're inputting the information about where the configuration can be reachable and what is the configuration name and what are the binaries. So the source system binaries are located here and the target system binaries are located here. The source system host name is this one and target is this. And that is all we need to input. This recover until parameter, uh, this is again, uh, if you want to have a point in time recovery, you can mention till what time you want to apply the logs and open the database for post-processing. Uh, for now, I am saying here, point in time in future, which means it will apply whatever logs are available and it will open the database. And once you're co done configuring the copy tool, uh, then comes the various plugins that, that Bernd talked about. So we have a data masking plugin. So if you want to do data masking in the post-processing phase, so once the database is copied, you want to mask. Uh, again, the same thing, we have um, configuration name, on which host, what support number, user, and password. But for this webinar, um, we want we want to uh, skip that part. We don't want to do any data masking. Uh, but if you are interested, uh, we can set up a separate session on that. 
And then there are different types of um, the tasks that are that we handle as part of the standard refresh. Um, and we classify them into objects, and these are the objects uh, which give you a brief overview of uh, the different uh, types of tasks that we have. So we have BDLS. Uh, the way that we handle BDLS, we have multiple scenarios. Again, I want to do a deep dive uh, on that shortly. Uh, and then we have the database copy part, which is checked, which means we want to do the database copy part, and then system checks, uh, and then the actual system copy. So most of the tasks here are uh, self-explanatory. As you see, we uh, do uh, our bad jobs, uh, CCMS config, D uh, DB59 connections, DBA cockpit. Uh, the default, it, it contains most of the tasks that we could not classify into any of these things. We are in the process of, as I said, the task team works continuously to categorize and put more categories into, into this section. But if, if you see here, if, if we are talking about a classic vanilla refresh, uh, I would say 85 and 90 percent of the tasks are covered here, and the remaining 10 tasks, 10 percent would probably be custom tables or custom reports that you run as part of refresh. But most of the um, activities are covered out of box, and you pull out the template and, and you have it. And then we have, uh, of course, customer uh, specific tasks. So if you want to uh, include some Z tables. Um, we, we just provide you a template and all you have to do is copy the tables and paste the table names and we take care of those tables. Uh, and uh, of course the BDLS, we have different ways of BDLS uh, which I'll, I'll come up, uh, I'll explain shortly. So let's quickly uh, keep an eye on the copy phase. Um, the copy phase is still running so uh, if we minimize this thing you would see that it requires uh, four more minutes to copy. Uh, so let me uh, then go ahead and continue with the tasks. So the categories itself is an overview, and then we can uh, talk about uh, tasks in detail. So if you, as I said, there are four phases. The check phase itself is not actually a part of refresh. It's just a value-added service where we want to make sure that we are doing um, the system refresh and everything is is aligned. So the check phase, you can completely skip them if you want to. Uh, the pre-phase is where we run the exports. So we have uh, most of the tasks as you see here, again, are self-explanatory. We export, um, we broadcast a message, we export the uh, settings before we modify SEC4. SLDs, we export bad jobs, we export users, we export um, logon groups, uh, CCMS, statistics, database uh, scheduling tables. Uh, as I said, we cover uh, 85 to 90 percent of uh, classical uh, refresh process. And once we are done with all the exports, we do all these exports in parallel. So as soon as it hits this export phase, you would be uh, seeing um, the exports happening in parallel. Uh, I would probably show this to you uh, in the post expense post space uh, kicks off. Uh, once the export Ports are done. Here is where the copy phase kicks off. So we stop the SAP again, stopping SAP. It's going to happen in the SAP way. So we are take care of all the apps, shutting down all the app servers, uh, database, and everything in the right order. And then we copy database. So these are the database copy tasks. We make sure the our copy tool is reachable. And then we drop the target database. Uh, we copy the database, make sure the database copy is successful, mm -hmm. and then open the database. So we do the rename, creating control files and everything um, in, in terms of Oracle is, is automated. The same goes with DB2. Uh, we do a um, real estate DB uh, for DB2 uh, for MSS Flow, the same thing. Uh, we open the data, rename the database with the target SID. And in the post-processing, we uh, start creating the op staller and uh, rebuild the indexes. In case of BW, some indexes will be corrupted, so we have to rebuild those indexes. And then we dump the data that we got from production. When I say dump the data, it's configuration data. It's not the actual user data. So we dump the configuration settings that we got from production, and we put the settings back by running the imports. So all the deletes happen in parallel, all the imports happen in parallel, and once the imports are done, we then start SAP. So 
till this point, we don't start SAP. After all the imports are done, we start SAP. And by this time, 80% of the configuration should be back and the system should not be talking with the production at all or, or into the production landscape. Then we do the user imports. We uh, run consistency checks, temp say, um, of course, uh, SLDs and run some more imports before we start the BDLS. And BDLS, again, is um, we have multiple ways of executing BDLS. We have uh, BDLS as um, uh, SQL, but we also have BDLS the way that SAP does. It's our standard, uh, we, we trigger the SAP way of doing BDLS, but uh, this is the default way that we normally uh, recommend because we uh, see it's much faster. So we identify the tables that require um, uh, conversion and then we create indexes on those tables. And then the, the, the logic behind creating indexes is in your hands. So you can go to the parameters and say, if the table has these many rows or more than um, these many rows, just go ahead and create an index. And then we split the list. So once you create index, we want to split the list. So again, if you want to split the list into 50 processes, provided your database can take that load, you can split them, but normally we recommend it anywhere between 5 to 15. Uh, we split the list into 10 different or 5 different lists and pass each list to an SQL plus statement and run the updates. Once the updates are done, there are, of course, some tables like DTPs and um, transformation tables which need conversion, uh, which, of course, is, is not being done by the standard BDLS process. So we have, uh, you typically run RSBK DDP uh, reports and other reports to do these conversions. Uh, but we have this task which is doing that conversion. So it takes care of RSBK DDPs, uh, transformation, and I think four or five different uh, special objects. Once we're done with the conversions, we drop the indexes, um, and we do BD54 after BDLS because these tables got exported and imported, so there should not be any change. Uh, we, of course, have central user administration tasks. Uh, right now, I don't have them, so I deactivated them. And then do consistency check, and um, we release the system. Uh, there might be are certain things that you are interested in, like the way that we handle bad jobs. Uh, typically, in most of the scenarios, you set the BTC process to zero and turn on SAP, make sure no bad jobs kick off. But we handle it a bit differently. We run, uh, we suspend the bad jobs, export the bad jobs, and then import the bad jobs. Uh, and when you start SAP, the bad jobs uh, should not kick off. So once bad jobs are released, we close the system and um, we release it to the end user and uh, the functional validation can happen and smoke testing can happen. And uh, as Bernd said, this is an um, repetitive process. If you think there is something which is taking longer time, you can always uh, tweak the task and try to um, get it uh, better. So right now, um, the copy is done. And if you look at the tasks here in the monitor, the copy is done. So the PDB copy is done. And now it validated that the copy is successful. And now it's switching or activating the database. So it's now actually going ahead and opening the database on the uh, VM2 side. So till now it just copied. It's up now applying the logs, creating the control files, creating init.ra files, and it's opening the database. And, and this is completely automated. Even if you have an, an snapshot solution, you probably still have to do this part. But if, if we go with this copy tool integration that we have in place, uh, you could see that uh, the complete uh, process or post copy database process is also automated. So now it's uh, shutting down database and now it's going to rename things and create uh, init sit files, create control files and it's get getting the database in in operational mode. So this probably is going to take um, a couple of minutes. Uh, the last thing I want to show you uh, in the in the graphical user interface of course uh, would be uh, 
the global parameters. So we have uh, some parameters that we use in, in our tasks. For example, this transport profile, we need this because we run user exports. We create, uh, we basically do a client export of user with a profile SAP user. So we uh, need the transport profile part. Snippets, these are um, function, again uh, some functional units which either you can use uh, if you're writing your own tasks or these are the snippets that we use in our tasks. As you see, most of our SQL tasks, they are BR tools based. So um, we, uh, we write these snippets and if, if, if you find it useful, you're more than welcome to use the snippets. We have a developer guide and um, you can follow uh, the developer guide and it should be pretty straightforward. The execution itself, uh, as you see, I'm not running a demonstration mode. This is, uh, this is one more example. So I'm doing an actual refresh here. Um, and uh, we have selected all the exports, deletes, and imports to happen in parallel. And we have some post-execution behavior. Um, uh, like, but the default is that we select that the user should exclusively select to finish the execution. Um, and we also recommend the tool to create the reports as soon as the execution is done. But you can do some more of these things like clean up the executions and uh, pack, zip the executions and keep them in, in archive location and things like that. And um, of course we can block the execution of refresh during uh, a specific time or we can allow the execution during a specific time. And uh, while the refresh is getting executed, do you of course don't want to see the GUI all the time so you can always schedule alarming so if you see that there is any warnings or errors you can close the GUI, schedule your uh, mail server and the tool will uh, email you that there is an error or there is uh, a warning or everything is trying to find. So let me go back to monitor here and uh, I want to show you the, the parallel execution. So you see the post phase is now kicking off and you can see that the tasks are indeed executing in parallel. So the post process is running now and uh, as I said, all the deletes happen in parallel, and once all the deletes are done, then we are putting the data back uh, using the artery trans import tasks. So I would like to talk a little bit about tasks while this post uh, is happening. So let me go here. I can't uh, make changes in this configuration, so let me pick up a other configuration. So I just want to explain to you a single task. For example, let's take this modify log on screen. So each task has a unique identifier. Uh, the tasks that start with L, they are from the belly. Uh, the tasks, uh, if you write your own task, you of course can, and they are starting with Z. And if we write tasks for you, um, uh, which means customized tasks for a specific customer, that would be, of course, labeled as Y. So each task has a unique identifier, of course a name, and you can select whether the task is client dependent or independent. Uh, and this is the category I was talking about. If we are not able to find a suitable category, we are currently putting them in default. Of course, your task will go in customer, so it's customer specific task. And each task has some attributes, whether it's active or not, which phase it's running, what's the location, so you can always change the location. So if you feel you want to do BDLS right after database copy, you can do BDLS because our BDLS is SQL, so we don't need SAP up and running. Uh, and then, do you want to wait after task execute? This is especially useful in case if you're doing task development, you want to see the result of the task before you continue, you can say wait after execution, and uh, the task type itself. Um, and then, what is the location the task is going to execute here at target SAP. And then we have parameters. So these are the things that, uh, these are the placeholders that we use in the task. So if you want to, this is basically modifying the log on screen. So most of our customers have the, uh, um, they, they have the log on screen with the system refresh date when it was last refreshed. So if they want to do a search and replace, the tool will do search and replace and uh, renamed or, or recreate the log on screen. So this is this is the task which is doing that. And then each task of course have return codes. We search for these return codes um, before we continue with the next task. So we see if the task is success, if it's a warning or it's an error. We only stop in case of error. If it's a warning, we mark it yellow and we continue. As you might have seen in the 
in the execution, there were some yellows. Uh, and of course, the code. I can't, we can't see the code here because I logged in as administrator. Um, so there are different types of tasks. I've selected to create a new task. As, as Bert has explained, uh, we do uh, the command scripts, we do PowerShell scripts, uh, we do SQL scripts, we do um, uh, ABAP programs, uh, we do RFCs, we do um, export, deletes, and imports, uh, we do R3 trans, we do um, transactions, so we execute transactions to a limited capability, uh, the reason being we need authorizations to execute some transactions. So, uh, And if there is anything that we cannot execute, we of course put an interactive stop there so that you can execute. And the last task uh, is synchronization point. I'll, I'll come to this uh, shortly. Uh, so those are the different types of tasks. Uh, and uh, let's see the status of the refresh again. So the refresh is happening now. It's uh, done with starting SAP. So let's go ahead and look into the SAP. So SAP is reachable. You can see that the logon screen information here, it's not yet modified. The reason being, we haven't hit the task yet. We will be shortly hitting the task. But um, this is a good example that we did indeed perform database copy and you see that it's SAP production system. Uh, so once we do the logon screen, so we're deleting the logon screen and we import the logon screen in this step. So once we are done with this step, I'll open the screen again and you could see that there is indeed differences here. Uh, creating configurations itself is uh, pretty uh, straightforward. Uh, we can go to the wizard. So if you click on new, it will walk, you can, it will um, pop up this wizard and you can create the configurations. Uh, you can say where the master is running. Again, the master server is a server where you uh, put the configuration. So currently I can create a dummy configuration. So I'm saying it's VM2. And now it's asking me uh, what's the name of the configuration. You can name the configuration. And um, where the task should be pulled. Uh, we, as I said, we have close to 450 tasks, and that is the repository it is referring to. Uh, I can take the internal repository, which is inbuilt in the GUI, or I can take the repository file, which is uh, something which I can input uh, that XML file. So basically, the repository is an encrypted XML file. So for now, we're good with taking internal repository, and it's getting the repository, and it shows us the version shortly. And then you define the target system. Um, I can say uh, RAL and VM2. It gets most of the information here. I select the system type, ECC. And then the source system. Uh, they are customers who don't want to install anything on source. And the tool gives you complete flex flexibility in doing that. And that's the, that's the beauty of this tool. Uh, if you don't want to talk with the source system, that's perfectly fine. Uh, the only downside is we cannot integrate database copy tool. You have to rely on your backup restore or use your existing snapshot technologies. Uh, but you have the complete flexibility of not installing anything on source. Because uh, if you look at the uh, task filtering, and if I select the system role and say, show me tasks which execute on source SAP. There is only one task which is executing. Again, this is check task which has no impact on the refresh. The same goes on source DB. There is nothing executing on source DB. So all the tasks execute on target SAP and target DB. And that is where you can completely isolate the tool only to target system. And that is the reason why um, we have uh, this the tool to execute only on target SAP and target DB so that we don't have to uh, talk on the talk with the source DB and source SAP. But again, as I said, the downside is you we will not be able to integrate the copy tool. Uh, so it's done now. So it's done with the BDLS and it's done with uh, all the steps. Um, so we can, as I said, 
the post execution uh, steps here says wait until the user explicitly finishes the execution. The reason is if you want to perform uh, the post steps again, if you want to, if you see that the system is not consistent, if you want to recopy database again and uh, do the post steps, you can very much do that. So you can dump everything, recopy re the database, and start with the post steps again. You don't have to run the pre steps because the pre is already executed and we have the data. So that's the reason why we have a stop here. And as you see, uh, the post uh, is finished. And let me quickly log in here and show you that the logon screen indeed changed. Now it's pointing to VM2. And let me quickly log in here and show you um, what we have seen. So the background picture is back to VM2. And uh, let's go to SU01 and look at the users. And you see that all the users are VM2 users. We export the users, we export the profiles, and all the authorizations with regards to the user. So we are done with the refresh. Um, the last thing I want to uh, talk about is uh, creating configuration, uh, which we uh, did. It's just as simple as running through this wizard. And of course, we have to tweak the task. We have to decide, uh, match with your process, decide what you want and what you don't want. And um, we can always um, uh, deactivate and activate tasks. It's as simple as uh, right-clicking and uh, uh, deactivating and activating a task. There are some more important things, maybe a uh, constraint. I might not be able to cover those things, but I'll do my best. The most important thing I want to show you with would be the templating. So on the left hand side, if you see templates, we have an option called templating. Templating is is, is a beautiful concept because uh, if you let's assume that you have an ECC system uh, which have multiple targets. You have two queue systems, two sandboxes, and some training systems, and the whole process, the whole refresh process for ECC is same, be it the sandbox, be it the quality, or be it to uh, training. Uh, what uh, we are uh, doing here is we have prepared a template configuration and added all the systems in the list. And whenever you want to perform a refresh, for example, uh, from VM1, which is sourced to VM4, you click on Derive, and you select, I want to do a refresh from VM1 to VM5, and name the configuration. And um, you have your comp uh, configuration ready with the system selected. So you don't have to um, create 10 different configurations. You have one template, and you can derive, keep on deriving the template. That's one uh, nice thing to uh, have, the templating. And of course, you can group configurations based upon uh, system types. For example, we can have a group for ECC. You can do group executions. So this is one group execution. And you can orchestrate the execution. This is, the, I think, this is the last concept um, that I would like to explain before I show you the documentation the tool generates. Uh, so you can orchestrate the execution by grouping the configuration. So I have here two configurations, VM1, VM3, uh, VM1, VM2, and VM1, VM3. And what I've done here is if we go to task, and if you look at the VM3 configuration, the last task here is a sync task. So if you have a group configuration, we can sync the configuration. So what I'm doing here is basically I'm putting a sync point in each configuration. So I have here a sync task in VM3, and of course, a sync task in VM2 as the first task. So the last task in VM3 and the first task in VM2 are sync. So if you are executing a group configuration, the sync points have to be reached uh, before the, the process can continue. So the sync points in all that group have to be reached. So in this case, the VM3 execution starts and it will finish off. It comes to the sync point and then the VM2 configuration starts. So let me quickly demo that part to you. So I'm doing a group start here. So the advantage of this again is if you want to orchestrate the executions. If you want to say I want to have all database copies finished and then continue with the post steps. So now if, if I go to the, this uh, VM3, so it kicks off, it starts with a check phase, but VM2, even though I said it, it's 
it's running, but it's just waiting in the sync phase because it's waiting for the sync task in VM2, uh, VM3 to be reached. So th there's a orchestration mechanism here. So imagine you have four or five refreshes uh, to be uh, happening, and in most cases, you want the uh, SCM, BW, and ECC to be to the same point in time. So this is how we we do all the pre here, all the copy, all the post, and then once it is done, the VM2 kicks off. So we can use this sync to sync up all the databases to the same point in time recovery. And um, the last thing before I hand it over to Keith would be to uh, talk about uh, documentation. So now that we have a, a automating tool which automates everything, we of course would like to have some documentation. It's pretty simple. We click on report. And you can say you want a long report or a short report. The short report is basically giving you a summary of the execution. The long report, uh, of course, attaches log files of each and every execution. So you'll be having close to 500 page document if you generate a long report. I, in fact, did generate a um, the reports here. So I'm going to pull up those reports real quickly. So this one is a long report, and this one is a short report. I'm going to open both. So I have the short report here, and I have the long report here. So if you see, the long report is close to 495 pages, and it contains complete uh, execution details of each and every task. So let's go to the overview of the report here. So you will see in all what's the master server, which hosts the configuration, and where the data files are stored. And then it talks about configuration, what are the systems, uh, what are the different tasks we executed. And then we talk about the effective duration, so it's around 45 minutes. That's exactly where I am heading to. Um, so we have 179 tasks which successfully finished, 17 warning, uh, and user reacted. Uh, they are two. And then different systems, what clients, what logical system names. And then we have this timeline. So we have a timeline talking about who executed what steps and when. So this is um, a uh, timeline that uh, we show up um, and uh, the different tasks and their uh, log, log files, of course. So this is uh, a very comprehensive report that you might want to keep in handy for auditing and things like that. Uh, and of course, we have user management concepts. So we have logged in here as administrator uh, who can create, modify configurations. But there are uh, other users like other roles like uh, operator who can only execute refreshes, reader who can only look at the refresh but cannot do anything. So we have com comprehensive LDAP integration mechanism and um, all those uh, scenarios. So I would like to wrap up uh, this. Uh, this demo. I hope you have um, you have uh, some some clear picture on what what we did in the last 45 minutes. But just to refresh uh, what we have done, we have done an end-to-end -end refresh of a real SAP system. I've shown you that the systems are up and running before the refresh. When the copy was running, the system went down. The VM2, and now it came up, and it we we could rename the the um, we we showed that the users are retained and the log on screens are written and things like that. So we focus on the pre, copy, and post based uh, post phases. I explained about how the pre is happening, database copy integration, the database copy tool, and uh, of course um, the post phase where we have the BDLS uh, integration. And um, finally, uh, we have talked about uh, creating configurations. There are different templates that you can create for different scenarios. And uh, of course, you could probably visualize the value that you get if you want to do multiple refreshes, group them, and uh, kick off the refresh. And you can sync all these refreshes and uh, uh, perform them, orchestrate them perfectly to, to your requirements.